Welcome everyone to the Personalized Learning Webinar Series and we're presenting and very excited to present Kevin Kroller from EdVision Schools on a topic, Why Hope Matters. This is Kathleen McClaskey and Barbara Bray has uh, been on, so Barbara, please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, this is Barbara. I'm uh, co-founder of Personalized Learning with Kathleen. And yes, uh, we just want to say that you can actually find us on www.personalizedlearning.com. But we also want to thank Classroom 2.0, Steve Hargadon, and Peggy George for supporting our webinar series. So, Kevin, I think I'm just going to let you um, go and um, really look forward to this very exciting presentation. Great, thank you very much. And it's uh, an honor for me to be here um, with the Personalized Learning Group. Um, I've been involved with Personalized Learning for quite a few years, actually about 15, 16 years now, um, here in Minnesota with the Edvision Network um, School, like the Minnesota New Country School, Edvision's off campus. So um, it's great for me to have the opportunity to uh, talk about some of that and see how it all kind of um, might connect. And um, I would like to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat window. Um, I'm fairly familiar with this Blackboard environment. I taught online um, here for or using this sort of thing for about five years. So I'm fairly familiar with it and can keep up with um, a few things going on at the same time. Um, and I do want to be using some of the, the poll features. We'll see how that goes. Um, and also, to make it a little less like a radio type thing, the texting that you're doing I think is, is great. Um, but there's also the emoticons that you can pull up and do little smiley faces or confused faces or whatever. Um, feel free to, um, to participate with that at any point in time too. Um, and I might react to those or not, but um, we'll get going with that. So um, welcome, somebody from, somebody from Virginia or Virginia from somewhere else possibly. So first of all, I want to look a little bit at some mission statements. Um, and for those of you from schools, um, and I'm kind of assuming that all of you are either from a school or connected to a school in some way. Um, and so I pulled up the Minneapolis Public Schools uh, mission statement, very similar to a lot of them around the nation. You can wordsmith them and change them a little bit, but really the big part of this is is that we're looking to end up with, um, we want to grow students into um, people capable of succeeding in their world. You know, so moving into the 20th, 21st century or whatever, um, but we want them to succeed in their work, in their personal and family lives, all of that. So um, just as a, a quick little poll thing, right now we're on a yes-no poll. So if the mission statement at the school that you work at or the schools that you work at or that are kind of connected with, your kids are connected with or something, if your mission statement kind of really focuses on that idea of future success, just click yes. If it, um, if it focuses on, or if it doesn't really focus on that, it focuses on something else and you can click no. And we're getting responses here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, and we, we see a lot of these mission statements that are really, really focused on this. So, um, so the next slide here is looking at a, um, a school, the Minnesota New Country School, that um, I worked at a number of years ago, uh, taught there for about six or seven years before I worked on starting a new school. Um, but this school is very much focused on future success, and that's one of their, their main missions, and that, that's kind of highlighted and put up front. Um, and so we're going to talk more about that as we go on, but I just wanted to show you a different school environment, um, a very personalized learning environment, and a very much of an environment that focuses on that future success. Um, one other mission statement that I pulled up, and this one is, was very interesting to me. This is from Detroit Public Schools, and there's a couple of them. Um, back in the bottom one here in 2003, um, was a mission statement that, again, really to me focused on that future success. We want productive citizens, lifelong learners, um, equipped with skills to meet the needs of the next customer, higher education, the world of work. Um, there, if you go to their website today, however, we find that the district's primary mission is educating students to perform at high academic levels. 
and um, and not that one is necessarily better than the other, it's just different. And the, these different mission statements, I think, really work to highlight uh, what I want to be talking about today. So I have a little diagram that's going to come up here, but in my mind, as, as we're working on this and we're going to be talking about this idea of hope, um, we're really looking toward this idea of future success and how do we end up getting there. And so, to me, there's a couple of um, a couple of different ways of getting. Well, there's probably a lot of ways to get towards this future success. And some of the schools we see kind of perform at high academic levels, and some of the schools um, might do something entirely different than that. And the schools that I'm really talking about and going to be working on today are really focused on setting goals, or having students set goals, having students make plans to meet those goals, and then working with students so that they persist to actually achieve those goals. And so it's kind of a, a, a different focus. It's a, a kind of a different pathway to get to that future success. Um, and I'm not saying that it's the best way or the only way. I'm just saying it's one of those, those other ways. I suppose I should say that it's the best way because I'm kind of biased towards this at this point and I've been working in it. Um, but yeah, in, in this environment, the, the students are really doing the goal setting. Um, it ends up being students' goals. It ends up being based on their interests a lot. But um, to start with, they probably need a lot of help. And so there's, there's advisors, there's teachers working with them to this. So it's, a, it's very much of a partnership. And then as we move toward that path towards future success, in the goal setting direction, this disposition towards setting goals, planning for goals, and persisting to achieve those goals, there's probably a lot of ways that schools or that um, learning environments could work towards getting that. So we're really, I'm familiar with, I'm going to be talking most today about a personalized project-based environment. And so you can see over on the left side, um, I can probably point in here, on the left side we've got project-based learning here and here. Um, and those project-based learnings are probably going to be focused a little bit differently. They might be focused more on meeting standards or being able to pass a test or to complete a course. Um, the personalized project-based learning that I'm talking about over here, this project-based learning is really going to be focused on students being able to set goals and make plans um, for those goals and be able to persist to achieve those goals. Um, yep, Barbara, that would be correct. And welcome, Cynthia. Okay, um, so moving on to this, because one of the things that people end up with, I've got over here on the left, I've got perform at high academic levels, and when I don't put that over here on the right, people immediately are kind of like, well, so now we're not focused at high academic levels. Well, um, that may not be the full goal, but what we end up with is as we're doing this personalized project-based learning, there's a lot of things that happen. We have students that are designing and planning and creating and inventing. They are meeting standards, state standards, local standards, whatever those things are. They are performing at high academic levels. Um, and they do end up thinking critically, collaborating, communicating effectively. So these things do happen. It's just that it's not, um, not necessarily the goal of the, um, the overall um, focus of the school is to do that. The overall focus is more on this, this idea of setting goals. And I think this kind of demonstrates, or it kind of highlights to me a difference that we're seeing in Minnesota quite a bit, um, where we have some schools or some schools of thought, really, that are kind of putting the standards, um, testing, and a lot of that as kind of the ceiling for the schools. And other schools and another kind of um, train of thought around education is having the standards and kind of the high academic or the, the academic pieces of this more as the as a floor, so to speak, kind of a base to build on, but then we're realizing that there's a lot more to grow on um, from that. So anyway, with all that said, and with that um, hopefully not too confusing demonstration, the title of this thing today is Why Hope Matters. And so now I want to pull in here on this idea of hope. And what we find is 
the late Dr. Rick Schneider out of the University of Kansas, when he was doing the study in the 1980s, 1990s, um, he came up with this idea that when students or when people set reasonable goals for themselves, make plans to meet those goals and persist to achieve those goals, he called that hope. So when we talk about hope and we talk about why hope matters, a lot of times we get these kind of um, almost religious ideas of what hope is. Um, people think of, they jump on a plane, it's like, oh, I hope this plane doesn't crash. And that kind of hope isn't really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is a very specific type of hope where, where students can actually see into their future and have a way to get there. So one of the things I wanted to do here is look at some other words around this. So we think that hope, hope is this word that's kind of been researched. Um, <laughs> and, and, but if you have ideas that might be better words for this, um, yes, and actually Shane Lopez, Dr. Shane Lopez worked with uh, Dr. Rick Schneider at the University of Kansas. And um, Shane Lopez is now carrying on a lot of that work through the Gallup poll and coming up with really, really good stuff around this idea of hope, around this idea of uh, a goal setting and things. But if you have other ideas for what hope might be, no, it's not even an acronym. And it'd be nice if it was. We've probably tried to come up with some of those. Um, you know, we've talked about calling it instead of hope, life readiness or something like that. Yes, and as you're listening to me, Peggy, maybe you can come up with a, a few ac possible acronyms for that that would work for us and we can consider those. The other thing is this idea, um, kind of the social emotional learning aspect right now, there's a lot of buzzwords around that right now, a lot of new things that, that keep coming out. Um, and you have probably heard of some of them. If you, if you can think of some off the top of your head, go ahead and type those in right now. Um, um, but otherwise, we'll, you know, we'll kind of keep moving forward with this too. But some of the, the things that I hear on a um, occasion, I'm supposed to probably give you a little bit of time here, but I feel like I'm on the radio. <laughs> so synonyms for hope would be one thing, but the idea of setting goals, planning goals, persisting to achieve those goals. Um, what, what are some of the other educational buzzwords that are going on for that right now? Yep, all the the perseverance and grit, I think, are some of them that are um, coming out. There's a grit scale that you can actually do a survey and get that idea of grit. Um, some of the others that, that we've heard about, two pathways, agency, um, resilience. So there's some other things that are coming out, and, and a lot of research is showing, showing importance of these in, in people's lives to, to be successful. So I think it's kind of a um, big deal thing. And this hope thing just jumps right into this. Another little fun fact on this um, idea of hope um, is when I did this presentation in Japan, um, in Japanese there was actually no word for hope, which was kind of interesting to me. But now they all know the people I presented to that hope is this idea of setting goals and planning for goals. They weren't tainted in any way uh, before they learned this new word for themselves. So a couple quick slides on some of this research. Um, research is finding that students with high levels of hope get better grades and graduate with higher rates than those with lower levels. Uh, the presence of hope in a student is a better predictor of grades and class ranking than standardized test scores. So we have a lot of focus on the standardized set on standardized test scores, but we end up finding that hope actually might be more important for some of those things. Um, and this one's from the Gallup student poll. This is actually Dr. Shane Lopez's work. Um, but hope drives attendance, credits earned, and GPA of high school students. Hope scores are more robust predictors of 
college success than our high school GPA, SAT, and ACT scores. And if you look at some of this, um, this research, and there's a lot of it out there, you find that this idea of hope actually points to success in the future. So not just um, test scores, college success, or whatever, it's actually looking at um, quite a bit of success, a more, more broad definition of success or future success than just the test scores piece. So I want to give a little bit of a, a background here. If this hope is important, and I truly believe that it is, it, it is important, we should probably know how to actually get this in our schools. And some of the research that Advisions has done gives us a recipe for hope. So I'm going to do a comparison here. Um, I really like these homemade chocolate chip cookies. And the only way that I've found to get the really good homemade chocolate chip cookies is actually to make them yourself. And you've got to bake them yourself, and you have to end up with this, with this wonderful cookie. To do that, you need to have the dough. But neither of these, the cookies or the dough, you really can't go to the store and buy. So just like hope, you can't go to the store, you can't go to the curriculum store and buy a book on hope and come back and say, okay, we're going to go through a class on hope, and when you're done, we'll all have hope. Hope is a changeable thing. <laughs> and as I eat more and more chocolate chip cookies, I just have growth around that, too, not even a growth mindset. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, but there's not really a curriculum around hope. You have, to, you have to go and make the dough, and the dough is made up of a number of different things. For example, you need butter. So chocolate chip cookies need butter. And I've tried making them with fake butter, but you end up really needing real butter to get the really good cookies. And that will compare it interestingly later on. You also need to have brown sugar, for sure. And you probably don't include Tabasco sauce. Now, different parts of the country might actually do this, but here in Minnesota, we do not put Tabasco sauce in our chocolate chip cookies. We also need to put in some flour. We need to include some eggs. And you need to have chocolate chips. Now, <laughs> um, with the chocolate chips, an interesting piece of this is, at the end here, we're, we're looking for this wonderful experience of a chocolate chip cookie. But as you start pulling out ingredients, the first ingredient you might pull out might be chocolate chips. You grab a handful, you eat them, and you start finding that satisfaction. Well, in hope, there's also a way to bypass the whole dough and the whole cooking process and go right from one ingredient right to the increasing the hope in a person. So what we have here is a picture of a group of people at Avalon School in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they are sitting around the table, and they are making chocolate chip cookies. Actually, they're probably building hope, and so this would kind of be the analogy to the, um, the next piece of the puzzle uh, as we get into this idea of hope. So as with chocolate chip cookies, we're looking to come up with, with hope. And how do we get there? Well, the main thing or the, the batter going into baking hope is engagement. So if you get students engaged, they will build hope. And but engagement is one of those things that you can't just go to the store and buy. So we, there's not a curriculum on engagement. And in our schools, we try a lot of different things to build engagement, to become engaged. Um, and and so what we, our research has found is there's a list of ingredients that go into this engagement. You know, the self-efficacy thing with hope, I don't, I don't know that I have an answer for you on that right now. Um, it'll probably come up a little bit in some of these constructs that I'm going to go through. So I'll let you think about that and see what you come up with on that on your own. So engagement. Um, the way we measure engagement is, is through a student survey. So we're not looking at attendance. We're not looking at um, did they turn in their assignments. We're actually asking them, are you engaged in your learning? It's the same. Um, methodology that's being used by the Gallup poll right now to determine engagement. And so what we find for this engagement, the butter of the batter 
of engagement is going to be autonomy. And you want to be making sure that the students have real sense of autonomy. They need that choice. They need that voice. Uh, and they don't, they don't want a fake autonomy. So I, I usually give this example of when my kids were small and I wanted them, wanted them to drink a glass of milk, I would hold out two glasses. I said, do you want milk in a blue cup or a red cup? And they'd be all excited and they'd say, ooh, blue cup, blue cup, I want milk in a blue cup. So they had choice. Um, and when they're four years old, that works. When they're in high school, they look at that as fake autonomy because in the end, they still drank the milk. So they end up doing what I got them to do what I wanted to do. They didn't really have a choice in the end. So autonomy is one of those pieces for engagement. The next piece for this engagement is the idea of mastery goal orientation. So we want students to actually be um, wanting to learn for the sake of learning. Um, it's kind of an intrin intrinsic motivation thing. Um, and that can be kind of a simplified way of looking at it, but it, what we end up calling it is mastery goal orientation. What we don't want in this engagement is a performance goal orientation. This is where students are doing something um, just for the grade, just because the teacher told them to, um, just because they have to um, perform. Now, like a drama, like a play or something like that, where they're actually performing and they're wanting to perform, that's not performance goal orientation. That would be back to the mastery goal orientation. So the wording on this is a little strange, but you don't want performance goal orientation uh, in your engagement batter. We also need academic press. And this is where teachers are pushing students um, very much like, um, so like a coach. They're alongside. They know just how hard to push. And some kids can be pushed harder. Some kids can't be pushed quite so hard. Um, and it's important that a teacher know the students and be able to provide this academic press to get the um, full level of engagement that we're looking at. Um, the next piece on this is belongingness. Students need to feel connected um, to the school, to the teacher, and they also need to feel connected to their peers. Now, if you remember with the, the chocolate chip cookie recipe, the chocolate chips at the bottom connected directly to hope. Interestingly enough, this peer-to-peer -peer belongingness also can lead to higher hope scores or a higher level of hope um, all in itself. It does not have to be um, mediated through engagement, through the, the whole baking process of this. So a couple of poll questions I'll ask you have you typed some stuff in here. Um, in the schools that you work with, which of these things um, do you see quite a bit of? And of course, my next question, but don't type it yet because that'll get confusing. The next question will be, which things are you not seeing so much of? Okay. And so I don't know if these comments are actually making it onto the recording. So some of the typing in, we're seeing mastery goal orientation everywhere. We're seeing performance goal orientation. Soon. Uh, another person, um, another person saying seeing too much of performance goal orientation. Not enough autonomy. We see we see more mastery goal orientation. Uh, not much autonomy again. Okay. So yeah, and I would agree the academic press, again, is probably a little bit limited. Um, a lot of belongingness and a lot of work towards that. The interesting pieces with this belongingness, both of these, um, there's two parts to it. There's a uh, professional and a personal belongingness, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and more than what I was planning on going into today, but I'll just mention it. As with the teacher, it's like, and I've been a teacher for many, many years, but there's always those teachers that really get along really well with kids, and oh yeah, we're buddy buds and all that kind of stuff. And that's a very good personal belongingness. 
But the other part of it is that you need to have kind of a professional belonging. You need to connect relationship-wise with, with the students on a professional level and be able to ask them about their work and all of that. And same thing with the peer-to-peer. -peer. There's both a personal and a professional. So I see a lot of belongingness in schools, um, a lot of usually geared more towards the personal than the professional. So the schools that we work in sometimes really focus on trying to how can we up that professional piece on both the teacher and the students. Yeah, and the academic press is an interesting thing too, because if you if the teacher presses incorrectly, you suddenly start making it into a performance goal orientation. So the, the teachers need to be pressing um, around the idea of in, not so much around you know did you get a good grade, but did you work hard on this assignment? Are you doing your best? What else can we be um, doing to improve? Or you know pressing towards that mastery instead of pressing towards the grade kind of thing. So engagement was one of the big pieces that um, is part of this whole idea of hope. And it's kind of in the middle of this idea of hope. And what we're seeing today, and this is out of the, um, from the Gallup poll 2009, um, and this has been consistent for, unfortunately, for, for quite a few years, and I think it can, can be consistent today too, but this idea of engagement. So we talk about this. Um, achievement gap and what a crisis that is in the United States and I'm not going to argue that that isn't because that is that is definitely a crisis that we have but I think what we really have in all our schools is a crisis of engagement and you look at a chart like this 69% of the students in fifth grade said that they were engaged um, in their learning by the time you get to 10th grade it's down to 35% and you see a little bit of bump of a bump in 11th and 12th grade but that bump is most likely caused from a number of students between 10th and 11th grade dropping out of school. So you don't have as many students to actually um, in the denominator of that percentage. So the percentage goes up. So we're not actually seeing an increase in engagement in 11th and 12th grade. Um, unfortunately, it's probably because of more students becoming totally disengaged and dropping out of school. And as we talk about this idea of engagement, um, it would be great if we could have a way to actually change that. So what we're seeing is that in the early 2000s, Dr. Mark Van Ryzen was working on this idea of hope and engagement and seeing that it went down. And there was a bunch of new charter schools in Minnesota. And he's like, I wonder if they've done anything um, different, if they can impact this differently. So he started studying some of our schools. And what he found is that he, he found engagement going up instead of going down in these schools. And because of that, he began studying this and doing a lot of work around this and what goes on in these schools to actually um, increase this engagement. And that's where the, that whole chart that I came up with um, came up with was his work on this. And so what we're finding is that the longer the students stay in school, their engagement went up, but he's also finding that there was an increase in hope. Again, another very positive aspect of of being in this type of school, but again, a positive aspect of setting students up for future success. So a couple of highlights. Um, yeah, I don't know that engagement equals hope, but engagement leads to hope. So you asked if they need extrinsic motivation. Um, so the intrinsic motivation is really the, um, the mastery goal orientation, and the extrinsic motivation is going to be the performance goal orientation. So, um, and I'll just let you look at some of these highlights from this, this hope, HOPE study that was done. Um, but it's fine. the conclusion on this, obviously, was that the assessment HOPE does truly matter. And then the other question is, are we turning out productive learners? Or simply academic achievers. And um, we really believe that there's academic achievement is very important, but there's a lot more that needs to go on to end up with successful students. So a couple of things. That's all really that I was talking about is really applicable to all sorts of schools. 
but we're in this uh, webinar by personalized, the personalized learning, and so I want to talk a little bit about what goes on in some of our schools. Yeah, the longitudinal study on the idea of hope, we've done a little bit of work on that and um, have found that the students, that if you build hope, a lot of them tend to maintain or continue to increase their hope. But yes, there are pieces of this puzzle um, like that that we would very much like to do more work with, um, come up with some more funding for, um, be able to move forward with. But this idea of hope is changeable. It's a malleable commodity. Um, and so you can impact hope, you can change hope, and once they have a higher hope, you know, they start having these pathways. They start having the agency. So as they can't afford college, that becomes a hurdle that they need to get over, you know, and they're able to work through that. Um, and so hopefully we're building them to a point where, um, building to a point where they, they have that capacity themselves, enough of that capacity themselves to move through that. And obviously it doesn't work with every student, but we really, um, <laughs> that's obviously the goal of this. So students in our personalized learning environment schools, some of the things that they do, so I, I pulled up some stuff from one girl here, some of the you know, quilt that she worked on, socks that she knitted, an art project, and then a more academic type thing with, with budgeting and some food expenses. But really the, the goal with her, with our students, is to focus on being able to set a reasonable goal, make a plan to achieve that goal, and then persist. So suddenly, knitting and socks or crocheting it probably is, I can't tell for sure. But again, that's something that actually works to build hope. And as time goes on, those sorts of things can work to also to build the academic scores. But we tend to focus more on building their hope in the academic scores following than um, focusing only on the academic scores, which tends to decrease the hope. Yep, and so when you get something that they're interested in, um, their, the mastery goal orientation usually goes up, giving them the choice is the autonomy piece of that. Um, but getting them to set reasonable goals, a lot of times they come in and they're like, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to build a rocket and go to the moon. And it's like, you know, we need to start somewhere a little less than that. So there's, there is a lot of guidance that really needs to, um, to go along with that. So some other stuff, kids are working on, you know, projects out in the shop. Um, all pieces of a bigger project, obviously, going through that. Here's a few other uh, projects. A couple of girls starting a business. I don't remember what this business is. Um, Tony is actually working on a, um, he was making a movie, and so he was creating props and costumes to go along with that. Um, the final movie was very interesting. You probably won't see that on the theater, but um, Tony would agree that it should probably go there. Down here we have a student building a super mileage car, um, working on designing a, a vehicle with a 3.5 or 3 horsepower engine and how many miles per gallon that he can get out of that. And over here we have a student that has set up a display of her artwork and really a great opportunity for her to express who she is and um, people can see who she is, but it makes her a little bit vulnerable but you had to give you an opportunity to showcase your work. Yeah, so each of these projects, um, every student is going to be writing a proposal. They use a, a program called Project Foundry to organize all of it. Um, they have to be approved before they start working on the project, and then all these projects are evaluated by at least two advisors when they're done. Um, Peggy, great question. Does hope breed hope? It actually does. There was a follow-up study done um, by Dr. Mark Van Ryzen, and um, the best predictor, I, th I think it was the best predictor of future hope increases, was previous hope increases. So it, it might actually be an exponential effect on that. Um, if you go to um, Assessing What Really Matters in School, the book that he wrote about this, it talks about that um, in there. Yeah, so Project Foundry is a great way to organize these projects. Um, and it's, it's not a course in classroom school at all. It's a very wide open environment. Students are spending, not only do they have to plan their project, they also have to plan their day. Um, 
they have to plan towards their whole graduation and come up with a plan. What do I need to do this year if I'm going to go off to college and do something like this in four years, or if I'm going to go off to work or go off wherever they're going to go off to? Um, it all is all part of the whole um, master plan that they need to work for. Um, another quick project here: a student that was not actually very motivated about academics, but she did like to do fashion. And yes, some students will have internships in their master plan. And that can be one of their projects that they set, set up. So um, this student here wasn't actually very motivated for the academic type stuff, but she loved fashion. And so her advisor got her looking at fashion in the 1920s. And then suddenly, you know, what colors are available in the 1920s, what fabrics are available, what was going on culturally that influenced the styles at that time. And just tons of history started to pour in. You know, if you look at the 1920s and what was going on and the, the culture clashes and all that kind of stuff, this girl suddenly jumped into history um, around the idea of fashion and didn't even know it. So this was actually a great project for the student. It was a masterful piece by the, um, by the advisor to get her to pull as much out of this particular project as she did. So that was a really cool project, but no, another one here. Um, some more projects, you know, using primary resources instead of textbooks is very popular. Um, studying geography, um, looking at different foods, different people, um, all, all sorts of different things can happen in these projects. So, and so you've been asking questions all along. Um, I'm open to more comments, more questions at this point. I know um, Barbara Kathleen is going to open up microphones for people to be able to ask. Uh, out loud. I just want to say thank you, Kevin. I'm really learning a lot. This has been great. Um, plus, I'm trying to follow the chat at the same time. Do you want any questions from the chat? Or do you want us just to open it up? Well, and there may have been questions from the chat is fine. Um, and so well, can we teach hope? That's a, to me, that's an interesting point on this. And I think it needs to be an environment. But what you need to focus on are those constructs, the autonomy, the mastery goal orientation, the uh, academic press, the belongingness. And as you focus on those things, you end up changing hope. And if you try to, you can, you know, kind of just focus on the idea of goals and things like that to just work on the idea of hope. But the real power in changing hope comes from focusing on some different things. And those different things can show up in traditional schools and, you know, innovative schools. There's a lot of different ways, especially belongingness. You can do a lot of stuff with belongingness, with academic press, um, in a very traditional environment. Autonomy, maybe not quite so much. Mastery goal orientation, maybe not quite so much. But some of those others you can really focus on just about anyway. Kathleen, I don't know if you opened up so other people can ask Kevin questions. I don't know if that's available or not. but. Um, if the talk button's there, if you decide you'd like to talk, you can raise your hand, or if you have other questions you want to put in to the, um, into the chat. Thanks for joining us, Andrea. We appreciate it. Uh, Andrea, she talked about um, the Genius Hour. She put some things in the chat, Kevin. So it seems like um, more teachers are trying to dip their toes into um, project-based work and interest, you know, where the uh, learners are working on something they're interested in, but they're not able to do it because of time constraints. So one thing you did not, that probably want to talk about is, how do you do this? What is the timing and how do you, how does it work with, um, uh, you know, like the, the one girl that was doing that around knitting and, um, and the other class she was doing? Right, and so in, in our schools, we've kind of done, gone whole hog into this whole thing. And so we've thrown out classes, we've thrown out bells, and the whole school is organized around student projects. So this is what they do. Um, so in that instance, it, time is not a factor. It's one of those things that, um, yeah, and so teachers doing 20% the, the Google time or, or whatever, um, but this is like 100% of time is people able to do this. So 
how do you, um, I'm just jumping in and if, if Kathleen if, or anyone else, if you have um, other questions, please jump in. But one thing I, I was wondering is you have it 100%, but how do they meet the requirements to graduate? What do you, what, uh, how do you work that? And then also, um, how do you, um, how do you work with the university so they, they either look at the projects or they look at the portfolios as um, meeting mastery? Yeah, and so students are um, working on these projects and as they get approved and as students are working on them, the advisor is going to be alongside of them. And so they're going to be looking at something and saying, oh, you're looking at this, this piece of part of history. If you were to do this a little bit more, or what you're currently doing will meet this particular piece as part of the standard. And so as they're going through projects, they're meeting different pieces of the standards. And the students get to look through the standards and kind of pick and see where they're, they're going with that. Um, there may be some standards that they just pick a project and say, you know what, I just need to meet economic standard. I'm just going to do something focused on economics. And so there might come to some times where that, that is the goal that they, they pick. Um, and through the use of Project Foundry, you're looking at, you know, from a student view, parent view, um, a teacher view, you're going to see all these projects that they're working on. But then you can print out a transcript that kind of flips the whole thing around and, and sorts it by um, standards category. So how much English do you have? How much history do you have? How much science? How much math? And so by looking at that project founder, you send that off to the um, university or the college, and they see that transcript, and they'll be able to say, oh, you know, here's their English stuff. What did they do? And they can see very specifically um, what projects were done within that English, or they can just see, oh, yes, they've got enough English credit so they can move on with that. Do they have to? Yeah, know. and I think that this. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. I was okay. just wondering about a, about so a portfolio. The whole, um, do they have, because you said that they have something from Project Foundry, but do they also demonstrate mastery in a portfolio? So, the, the list of projects and the uploaded information for each of those projects ends up being um, actually a pretty decent portfolio that comes directly out of Project Foundry. But you can, and a, a lot of our schools do not do this yet, but Project Foundry also has a portfolio aspect. So you can just pick out those things that you would want to end up in a portfolio, kind of um, filter a little bit and end up showing this is what I want. Um, in my portfolio. So that would be kind of an additional piece to this puzzle. Do they also do some type of exhibition um, and demonstrate mastery to, you know, their peers or the yeah, community? So, yeah, each of these students will, and depending upon which school you're in, there's going to be a, a different requirement. But usually two or three presentations of some kind are required. Some of them are just quick little exhibit where you might be standing next to a product or to a display board or some sort of um, whatever your project is and just chat with people about it. And then they will also be required every year to do a stand up in front of a group of people and do a presentation and talking about their project, where they're at, um, what they've learned from that. And those, those increase in, um, I suppose, rigor, you might say, as time goes on. So by the time that they're a senior, they're doing a 300-hour project. And the presentation for that is going to be about a 25-minute presentation in front of a larger audience where they're defending their work. I have more questions, but I don't want to take up the whole. <laughs> I'll just jump in until someone else comes in. Um, please interrupt me. Uh, but uh, let's see. Oh. I see Peggy has some things, but I just wanted to see if there was a, you know, other type of questions. But my, I wonder, are they all in, do they do all the work in school? Do they also work at home? Do they work online? What is the, um, what is an average learner in, in EdVisions doing? Um, so a couple of different things. One, in our, in our most normal type schools, they will head to school and they'll be there from eight till three, give or take. Um, and they'll be spending most of their day working on projects. A lot of students will be spending time at home doing something, whether that's reading or researching or building something, or they might have you know, music and they might be playing the guitar at home. Um, so there's a lot of, <laughs> kids do a lot of homework and they log time 
for their project outside of school, but almost none of them call it homework <laughs> because it doesn't seem like a typical idea of homework. Um, we also have an online school um, where the students are at home all day and they're just connecting through Blackboard Collaborate like this. There will be teachers and different breakout rooms set up and students coming in for advisory groups. They'll be coming in for math groups, art groups, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, meetings with other students. Um, so, and that would be a totally different way where there's really no time spent in a school building except for the fact that an environment like this becomes their school building. So I like that. In fact, um, Peggy just said that I, working on projects instead of working at, you know, homework because there seems to be a, uh, a connotation about homework where they actually probably are doing more when it's about something that they're passionate about. Right. You get to that mastery goal orientation and they want to, they want to get better. They want to find that next thing. They ask the next question and they want to find the answer for it. So, um, and again, as we talk about this, 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 that's, that's the way it's supposed to work. There's still students that come in and they're like, oh, I don't want to do anything. What do I have to do this for? And they're trying to figure out a way to jump through the hoops. Um, but again, this is a way for them, for you to get in front of them and say, what do you really want to work on? What can you um, start working on? And some of the projects are very simple to start with, but they, then they will build from there. Do you have oh, yeah. a place? And the projects that the students are doing are very much the student's projects. It's not the parents doing the projects for the kids. Yeah. So it's good. Good point, Peggy. Do you, um, do you have some places where they showcase these projects so we can showcase them? Um, each of the schools website, so you can go to edvisionschools.org and we have a list of schools there. If you go to those websites, um, there will be different links, different YouTube sessions and all that kind of stuff. So it's um, very much a different um, they're all different, so it's, but there's different ways that different schools showcase it. We just don't, we don't have just a list of projects or whatever. So Kathleen asked if they have project advisors. This is what the teachers do in these schools. The teachers are the project advisors. So instead of the teachers being up in front of the classroom spewing content, um, trying to get kids to learn something that the teachers want them to learn, the teachers are sitting down next to these students um, helping them design projects, helping them fill out project proposal forms, helping evaluate the projects. Did you really learn this? Did you not learn this? Did, did this count as a particular standard or not as a particular standard? So yes, um, the role of the teacher is totally and completely changed. Uh, I have a question. Are these projects, do they go on like for say three to six months uh, where they're a like a uh, exhibition uh, in the end? Um, maybe that question was asked before but uh, that's what I'm familiar with. So, and it varies considerably. Um, each, some of the projects might last for a week as students are starting out. Um, and there will be projects that might last for an entire year. And usually you cut it off after a year and they have to start it up again okay. if it's a multi-year project. Um, and yeah, the, the, let's see, let me jump back to some of these other questions. Okay, how many learners are assigned to, to each advisor? Um, usually we have in our online schools about 15 students per advisor. Our brick and mortar schools are probably 18 to 22 students per advisor. And if you look at, and this goes along with the teacher-led schools part two, so a lot of our schools don't necessarily have principals. You're going to have a distributed model of, of leadership. Um, and so when you, we have the, the 20 to 1 um, student to teacher, that's very similar to what you're getting in if you look at most traditional schools. If you take all the students and divide by how many licensed teachers you have, you get down into those, those lower number ratios. Um, but then you start taking teachers out as specialists and other teachers that are doing administrative work and some bigger classes, smaller classes. It doesn't necessarily look like those are the numbers. But if you look at actually the, um, the databases, that's um, getting pretty close to the numbers. And then from a um, financial model, um, you know, you go from 18 to 19 students per advisor or something like that, you can actually pretty much change the dynamics of how much cash you have to work with and can do more things with field trips, with um, supplies for students and some things like that too. 
thanks, Kevin. Uh, boy, this has been a great uh, session and uh, lots of great information about Advision Schools and the whole topic about why hope matters. And uh, we really want to thank you for joining us today and sharing all of this because uh, I'm sure that lots of people don't have this um, insight that you have around hope uh, and why it matters in schools. But we also want to leave everyone with uh, Kevin's contact information uh, at Ed, Ed Visions as, long, as well as his phone number. But we want to make a special note that this webinar is being archived and, uh, and recorded and will be found on our site uh, at www.personalizedlearning.com slash p slash webinar series dot html. So you can go there. Um, again, uh, we also want to thank Peggy for joining us and facilitating some great discussion. Um, and thank you, Peggy, uh, again. And so um, we're going to sort of um, end this particular session and let you know about our next webinar series. OK, so. Our next um, webinar our next webinar series is with um, Elliot Washer. It's uh, two weeks from now, Tuesday, February 25th, same time. And it is uh, all about leaving to learn. It's about what happens, uh, similar to what um, Kevin was talking about, is hope. What is it that they need? What, is the, uh, what engages and increases their engagement and makes it so they don't want to uh, drop out? So we hope you join us. Kathleen, is there anything else? But, and Kevin, thank you so, so much. This was very exciting. Yeah, so uh, just to give you an idea, Elliot Walsh is, is one of the co-founders of Big Picture Learning, which is a large-scale model, uh, high school model, where kids are really following their passion and they're highly engaged. So we really look forward to you coming back to our next webinar series. Spread the word. Thank you, Kevin. Did you? I'm, I'm going to put it back. Kevin, is there anything you'd like to say to the, At the end, I was going to. I was trying to come up with an acronym for um, hope, but it, <laughs> I just couldn't. <laughs> I was really working on it here. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have an acronym for hope, but I just want to say thank you again. It was uh, an honor to be um, welcomed into your webinar series. I appreciate it and. Uh, enjoy the opportunity to, to meet with this group here today. And thanks everyone for participating and commenting and typing and all that kind of stuff. Well, thank you. We also, um, just to let you know, we're going to archive the chat. And um, with the post that you created for us, we're going to put this, uh, the video and the chat so people have access to them. I'm going to end the recording. <laughs>